Plenty of people out there have been raving about a new first-party Bethesda game, a galaxy-spanning adventure filled with the promise of exciting locales, exotic creatures, bloodthirsty pirates, and alien mysteries. Their first original IP in 25 years, Starfield. Every time a new Bethesda game looms towards a release window, a swirling tornado of hype and controversy surrounds it. Todd Howard pops his cute little elf in face onto a press conference to assure us that this game, this masterpiece, will be the next iconic, expansive, immersive, polished RPG experience to end all RPG experiences. And fans eagerly believe him, or at least give him the benefit of the doubt. All of this just works. It's not, I'm not kidding. And in a post-Skyrim world, each game that followed has been a massive world sprinkled with bugs and half-baked mechanics that left many players at least a little disappointed. Or, in some cases, flat-out appalled. And yet, every time, Bethesda fans keep crawling back once the slightest spark of a new Elder Scrolls game or Fallout title lights up our social media feeds. It sounds like a toxic relationship, and maybe it is. I can say this because, well, I'm stuck in it too. Ever since the days of Daggerfall lit up my smooth, wrinkle-free child brain decades ago, I've spent hundreds of hours marching through the mushroom marshes of Morrowind, piercing the portals of Oblivion, and sifting through the smoldering ruins of Fallout. I've slain the countless ancient dragons of Skyrim, I've saved settlement after settlement at the request of Preston Garvey, I've even found the fun in Fallout 76. Yeah, I know. You could say this makes us fans, but there's a difference between a fan and a full-blown zealot. While the diehards out there are quick to hand wave any criticisms, we've witnessed the evolution of each of these games long enough to see them for what they are. They're vast, glorious messes, sprawling worlds that all share the same building blocks of design. Games that trip over their ambitions, often jumping towards the stars while they stumble over their untied shoelaces. These games are all flawed but fascinating, and each of them contain a certain X factor that only Bethesda can provide. It's the Bethesda recipe. Starfield is disappointing, and yet it's still compelling. This video is not just going to be another warrantless praise or brutal assassination of the game. It will not just be a highlight reel of its backwards design choices and annoying bugs, although there are more than a few. Is something amiss? It will not dwell on the various allegations of employee abuse at the company, suspicious review score discrepancies, or, I can't believe I have to say this, the eye roll inducing politicized outrage surrounding it. We'll be reviewing Starfield. Wait, we're reviewing Starfield? Aw oh, man, I thought we were reviewing Garfield. I played through so much lasagna cat action all for nothing. I wonder what happens when I suck this. Uh, no. Sorry to hear that. So Todd Howard didn't make Garfield? Contrary to popular belief, Todd Howard did not create Garfield. However, he is a direct model for John Arbuckle, but we'll be reviewing Starfield. More than that, we'll be trying to determine what makes Bethesda games so engaging for millions of fans, even when what they release is buggy, broken, under-realized, or unfinished. How much social capital does Todd Howard have left to spend? If Bethesda consistently breaks their ambitious promises, why do we keep forgiving them? Sometimes it doesn't just work. Let's see if we can find out. My name is Boss Sauce. And I'm Roland Kearns, and together we, we are, are the, the Two-Headed two -headed Hero. Hero. The story of Starfield actually begins long ago and far, far away, in the age of the before times. So buckle your space belts, a history lesson is coming in hot. History lesson! On March 25th, 1994, a little game called The Elder Scrolls Arena was released onto MS-DOS PCs. At this time, Bethesda Softworks was a fairly well-regarded developer and publisher based out of Baltimore, Maryland, but was mostly known for licensed games and sports titles like Wayne Gretzky Hockey, The Terminator, and... Wayne Gretzky the Terminator. Arena was an ambitious change of pace for the studio, a huge map sprinkled with hundreds of procedurally generated quests, dungeons and towns, real-time first-person combat, and a realistic day and night cycle. It might not look like much today, but in a lot of ways, this was the great-grandfather of Starfield, and the primordial example of the Bethesda recipe. Now, Arena didn't sell well at first. Only 3,000 copies moved at release, partly due to the reluctance of retailers and distributors to carry a game that prominently features such, uh, heavy weaponry 
on its box art. Despite this, RPG-starved gamers would slowly and surely discover the title by word of mouth alone. Arena wasn't without problems. Procedural quests and locations made the game feel samey after a while, and it was plagued with technical issues. These criticisms now feel pretty familiar, and still pervade the rest of Bethesda's releases to this day. However, the game's minor success and good critical reception was still encouraging enough to warrant a sequel. 1996 saw the release of The Elder Scrolls II, Daggerfall, which featured refinements to many of the first game's concepts and took exploration to a whole new level. While it still failed to address all the previous game's issues, it held a more engaging story, spellcrafting, alchemy and enchantment systems, and fully realized 3D dungeons. It was also the first appearance of the Elder Scrolls series' iconic usage-based skill progression system, which made players feel more immersed in the role-playing aspects of the characters that they created. Word of mouth had created a high expectation for an arena sequel, and Daggerfall moved 100,000 units within the first couple days of release, which might not have sounded like much compared to console mega-hits from the same year like Super Mario 64 or Resident Evil, but it was absolutely staggering for a niche computer role-playing game. Both Arena and Daggerfall built a substantial cult following in the passing years, and both have received source ports that hold up surprisingly well even today. Daggerfall also saw the departure of many of its lead designers, including Ted Peterson, Vijay Lakshman, and designer-programmer Julian LaFay, who is considered by many to be the father of the Elder Scrolls. When this power trio went on to greener pastures, this was Lil Toddy Boy's time to shine. Yes, the man has become a meme in recent years, but it's also easy to forget that Todd Howard was instrumental in the company's rise to popularity. Who's laughing now? <laughs> Todd's recent successes with his work on a pair of well-received and actually awesome Terminator-themed first-person shooters and a well-reviewed but pretty mid Elder Scrolls adventure spin-off had landed him in the big project lead chair. If I can get that lazy Rolo to bring it up from the harbor. Easy Rolo, fat or sane. But things were not going smoothly. During this period, Bethesda was stuck in a downward financial spiral, and they needed a hit. And in 2002, they finally got one with Morrowind was a true turning point for Bethesda as a company for Todd Howard's rise to fame, and for the Elder Scrolls as a whole. Rather than the vast continent-spanning setting of Daggerfall, Morrowind took place on Vardenfell, the Black Isle, an original fantastical setting off the coast of Morrowind that was filled with ancient mysteries and giant mushrooms. It had a wild, compelling main quest which involved the creation and destruction of the Dunmer gods, but also encouraged exploration and experimentation at every turn with its freeform design and lack of handholding. The step away from procedurally generated dungeons in favor of more handcrafted locations made Morrowind feel far more cohesive and alive than any prior game in the series. This was the last Elder Scrolls game to truly feel like a classic computer RPG, but also the first to get a console release. Morrowind was also the first in the series to truly embrace the practice of modding. Thanks to the Elder Scrolls construction set, there are massively ambitious mods for this game still in development today. Sure, the combat was somewhat shit, but it's hard to overstate how important and influential Morrowind was for video games in general. Even though it wasn't revolutionary, I still hold a special place in my heart for The Elder Scrolls IV, Oblivion, which lets you chase Daedra through giant flaming portals and stalk the citizens of Cyrodiil as they went about their surprisingly detailed routines and shouted at you with full voiceover. Stop! You violated the law! Plus it had Patrick Stewart. Let me see your face. You are the one from my dreams. <laughs> and the best goblin. However, the real test of the Bethesda recipe came in 2008 with the release of Fallout 3. There's no question that this game represented a massive departure from the classic isometric CRPGs from Black Isle. Still, Fallout 3 refined Bethesda's approach to storytelling and quest design significantly, while capturing the previous game's unique post-apocalyptic vibe. It also proved that Bethesda's open-world freeform designs could be molded to fit other settings besides high fantasy. And while Bethesda can't even claim to have created the greatest Fallout game... Nobody's dick's that long. Not even Long Dick Johnson, and he had a fucking long dick. 
thus the name. Fallout 3 was a major stepping stone nonetheless. After the triumph of Fallout 3, its codebase was forked into the creation engine, which formed the basis of Bethesda's most successful game to date. Pop quiz, what's the most successful Bethesda game? Gotta be Skyrim, since that game was released like a hundred different times, right? Nope. That honor actually goes to Fallout Shelter, and it's not even close. But as far as Bethesda RPGs go, Skyrim soared high above all its predecessors during its 2011 release window. If you somehow haven't played this dragon slaying adventure, well, good news! It's been ported to pretty much every conceivable platform. Skyrim's continued popularity caused other studios to take notice and contributed to the rise of open world games in the AAA space. The new creation engine was able to take advantage of visual improvements, better physics, and radiant AI. But Skyrim also took the first step back from handcrafted quest content with its radiant quest system. Could you deliver the ashes to Runil, the priest of Arcade? Until next time. Post is responsible for the cemetery here in Fortress. I take care of the shrine. Ah, Barrett's ashes. Vast as an ocean, deep as a puddle is a phrase often encountered when describing modern open world game design, and this was first attributed to the design of Skyrim. While there was a staggering amount of content within the main quest lines and factions, many of the side quests felt a bit shallow, never amounting to more than kill the monster or fetch the thing. And let's not forget about the absolutely spectacular bugs that the game had on release. Once again, it was modders to the rescue. Armed with the brand new creation kit, Skyrim modders have twisted the base game into sometimes unrecognizable states, adding everything from additional quest and zone content, to complete system overhauls, to, um, Randy Savage Dragons. Yeah! Bethesda would lean more and more on the modding community to fix their games after release, a trend that would continue to grow with every following game. Let's not forget about the icky moves Bethesda made to monetize the works of modders with the Creation Club. In response to this money-hungry maneuver, a significant number of mod creators moved their works to Patreon paywalls, while many others continued to release their patching projects for free on sites like Nexus. Fallout 4 leaned into the radial quest design even further, with Preston Garvey continually nagging you about another settlement that needs to be helped. So what do you plan on doing about the jet problem in our community? How about the settlement problem? Another settlement needs our help. And arguably the most lackluster and predictable main storyline in a first party Bethesda release since Arena. It did have jetpack though. Although later DLC did wonders to add some interesting choices and player agency, the nebulous dialogue system and lack of impactful choices made Fallout 4 a somewhat underwhelming role-playing experience. The game still had its strengths, improved combat, the ability to construct your own outposts, I did all of them, why did I do this? Deeper crafting mechanics and weapon tuning, and awesome customizable power armor. With jetpack. With jetpack. But the focus of Fallout 4 was clear. Cooler toys over deeper experiences. And this approach would backfire with... Fallout 7SS. The promise of a multiplayer Bethesda game was exciting, but Fallout 76 was a vault tech experiment gone horribly wrong. Fallout 76 at launch was a hollow game with none of the elements that made the prior Fallout titles great. Quests were incredibly basic and all delivered via audio log. Gameplay was broken and buggy, and server problems compounded all the issues that existed in the engine since Skyrim's release. A card-based progression system was put into place that seemed like a gigantic step backward, and theft was removed almost entirely. Well, at least, in-game theft was. Bethesda's behaviors around the game's monetization, broken pre-order promises, and the shallow games-as-a-service approach to updates which mostly featured cosmetic items for the cash shop or grindy public events, didn't really do much to help its reception. Years later, after the Wastelander update finally added NPCs, holy shit, NPCs in a role-playing game, I finally got around to giving Fallout 76 a proper chance. Even with another 18 months of cooking, it still felt pretty underbaked. The same old creation engine bugs resurface like a hungry mire lurk and the ever-present cash shop pops its ugly head up from time to time, but joining up with a buddy to explore and loot your way through another giant Fallout map and stumbling upon the vast creations of other players held my attention for far longer than I expected it would. Unfortunately, this was still a really small concession after breaking the trust and crushing the hopes of the vast majority of Fallout fans. 
It would still take something greater to pull Bethesda back out of the black hole they'd created for themselves with Fallout 76, and Starfield promised to be the pinnacle of the Bethesda recipe. It would feature the meaningful NPC interactions of Oblivion. It would have a bigger focus on dynamically generated quests, a throwback to Bethesda's RPG roots in Arena and Daggerfall. The crafting, scavenging, weapon tuning, and outpost construction of Fallout 4. The jumpomancy of Morrowind. The vast exploration of Skyrim. But instead of exploring a single fantasy realm, Starfield takes place across dozens of star systems, thousands of planets. Players would get to enjoy fully realized space combat and ship customization. All of this would be powered by the shiny new Creation 2 engine. But do all these ingredients add up to a better game? Well, I really want to know if it does, but I'm still bummed that I played the wrong game. I hear you, buddy. Don't worry. I've got just the thing to cheer you up. It's time to play a little game I like to call Starfield or Garfield. I'm going to ask a single question and you have 10 seconds to decide whether it's something featured in Starfield or if this is prominently displayed in Garfield. Win all three and you get a shot at the grand prize. Are you ready? I'm ready. Wait, no. Uh... Round one. Which one features the use of ground vehicles? Starfield or Garfield? You have 10 seconds to respond. My vast Garfield knowledge, I know that there's a Garfield kart racing game, so it's gotta be Garfield. Final answer. Ah, uh, okay, well, sorry to say that Technically, this is a trick question, because Starfield and Garfield feature the use of ground vehicles. John can be seen driving a car in many instances, such as in Garfield on the Town, 1983, an animated episode where Garfield has to be taken to the vet. And while Starfield does not have any drivable cars, the city of New Atlantis prominently features a commuter train. But Garfield has drivable cars. However, Garfield does have the advantage here, having an entire kart racer. Give me that point, I want the grand prize. As Starfield opens, some white text tells us it's the year 2330 before fading into an elevator ride. The player is tossed into the dusty space boots of a humble mine worker, just another poor schlub that has to laser blast rocks on a forsaken moon for the pleasure of a paycheck. And right away, we're following some slow walking NPCs. Ah, it's one of those tutorials. Good morning, Mr. Freeman. Looks like you're running late. A short hike later and you're chiseling some weird modern sculpture out of a cave full of mysterious green crystals and suspiciously floating rocks. A single touch of the cave art sends your brain through the ending sequence of 2001, A Space Odyssey. You wake up to the sound of your supervisor asking which health insurance to bill, and this is a clumsy intro to the character generator. There's a ton of sliders, hairstyles, and body types here to help customize your adventure clown, and even though the models look a little bit dated, it's easy to make a skeleton man or a big beefy lady or anything in between. Perks and backgrounds help round out your weary space traveler and add a little bit of role-playing flavor, at least superficially. Over the course of the game, the occasional dialogue option or side quest that these options provide don't have any substantial effect on the way Starfield plays out. But meet my main man, Chin Lee the Kiss Boy, a former space trucker from the grimy streets of Neon who lives to make his mommy and daddy proud. Aw, sure, he looks a little bit like old Greg. He's in our fuzzy little man, Peach. But his only crime was smiling too much, resulting in a medical condition that he's still recovering from to this very day. What's it called? Smiliosis. Smiliosis of the liver. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, the Argos Mining Company decides that the best person to hand off the strange and valuable artifact to its buyer is the dude with a recent aneurysm. So slap on your spacesuit and outside you go, into the crusty gray atmosphere of Vectera. A creaky ship shudders to a landing and out comes Barrett, a roguish explorer type that Starfield continually tries to pass off as a charming and quirky side character, but ends up feeling more like a dollar store Lando Calrissian. During the handoff, Barrett brings a horde of Crimson Fleet space pirates to your doorstep and directly causes a bunch of miners to be slaughtered in the ensuing shootout. What a wacky guy, am I right? Gunplay is pretty familiar here to anyone that played Fallout 4 or basically any modern first-person shooter in the last decade, even if it's a little basic for Starfield's first dozen hours. We're gonna get deeper into the combat later, but for now, say it's fine and functional. 
To make up for the pirate indiscretion, Barrett hands you the keys to his spaceship, the Frontier, and makes you the temporary guardian of his cool robot, Vasco, with the caveat that you'll deliver the blue raspberry flavored artifact off-world to his buddies at their little explorer club, the Lodge. Hopping aboard the ship gives you a little taste of space, and Vasco makes a pretty good wingman, even if he does lock the navigation controls on you. Ship controls are console friendly, but done really well. Things like power management, weapon targeting, and scanning are super easy. If this entire feature was more fleshed out, space exploration could have been a game all its own. Vasco takes this opportunity to teach you the basics of ship flight, letting you get familiar with how the Frontier handles and cheering you on as you blow the freshness seals off some pirate vessels. A scan reveals the pirate's point of origin to be a nearby moon, and Vasco basically refuses to be satisfied until the threat is dealt with. Yeah, behind that cute, shiny black camera lens lurks the mind of a bloodthirsty killer. When do we kill all humans? Since this is your first time on a fresh new planet, you have the opportunity to look around a little, scan the wildlife, even laser blast some ore with your cutter. Which isn't exactly gripping, but helps with the zen feeling of the game's exploration later on. Plus, harvesting some rocks or plants or creatures lets you walk away with some useful materials for later research. Eventually, you'll bump into the stronghold of those pesky pirates, which is basically the game's starter dungeon a long-time Bethesda tradition. Explosively decompress some more pirates and break into some safes using the new Space Lock Picking minigame, which is actually pretty fun. Fight your way to the rooftop and you'll have the chance to roll for persuasion on the buccaneer boss and scare him off. Or if that doesn't work out, persuade him with some more ballistic measures. Around this time, you'll have the opportunity to level up, and here we'll see that Starfield features a more traditional experience point-based system. Leveling up grants the choice of a perk, with higher perk levels gated behind some rather mundane challenges. With the pirate threat taken care of, Vasco will prod your space mission onward to New Atlantis, where you'll meet the rest of the Constellation crowd. Adding your giant blue toenail clipping to their little pile causes a gravitic reaction of some kind, the likes of which had never been seen before. It's clear that these pieces are only smaller parts of a larger whole. Yeah. <laughs> larger whole. <laughs> so you're unceremoniously inducted into Constellation and entrusted with a vast star hopping quest to track down the remaining artifact chunks and figure out what it do. Since it's set in an entirely new universe, Starfield has the distinction of being unburdened by decades of lore. There's no callbacks, no in-jokey references for the game to fall back on. This complete removal of any nostalgia lens also makes it easier to see its mechanics laid bare. At the surface level, Starfield looks like another Bethesda Fallout game that's been painted over with a space-themed brush. Guns become space guns. Lockpicking becomes space lockpicking. While a lot of these analogs are absolutely true, there's more to it than that, so let's dig a little deeper. As we mentioned before, combat comes in two flavors, ground and space. Stomping around Planetside will feel familiar to fans of Fallout 4, containing the same controls, contextual cover, rudimentary stealth system, and overall flow. At first, fighting on foot feels a little basic, but unlocking the movement skills opens up combat significantly. Investing in the jetpack allows you to bounce around the battlefield, and there's an option or two sprinkled through the skill trees that add some more movement dynamics. With a couple perk points in the right places, one can easily make something of a boom shoot build that lets you swoop down like an angel of death. This stuff really feels like it should have been part of the player's move set from the beginning, and it's kind of puzzling to me why Bethesda decided to hide the fun of the combat loop several hours in, but that doesn't mean it's not fun. There's a few areas that add some cool twists to the rest of the shoot and loot formula, like encounters on low gravity planets, or zero-g gunfights in space stations. Fights never get too difficult, and you can usually spam heal your way out of danger, at least on the default difficulty level. If a battle's really not going your way, you can also fall back on the signature move from every Bethesda a game. The Save Scum! Starfield features a ton of weapons that all look and work differently, and designs strike a great balance between form and function. Energy weapons and the grenade launcher feel particularly good to use. It's a shame that the ballistic guns make the sounds of microwaved popcorn 
and feedback is somewhat lacking for even the biggest and baddest that the arsenal has to offer. It's a bigger shame that there's not really a reason to take advantage of this arsenal. The random loot distribution is so uneven that one pistol dropped by a high level merc can carry you through the entire game. And in my case, it did! Unfortunately, the flaws don't end here. The enemy AI, well, let's just say it leaves something to be desired. The game's various pirates and spacers all use the same tricks, with their only real difference being the outfits they wear and the weapons they wield, so the first hour of the game feels much the same as the 60th. Human enemies are pretty spongy, which seems to kind of go against the whole hard sci-fi sealed spacesuit vibe that the game's going for. You'd think two or three taps from a big beefy gun would be enough to vent some feisty spacers, but this is rarely the case. Combat against the variety of hostile space creatures feels much the same and suffers similar problems. Players have noticed. There's already mods out there to decrease the time to kill, improve stealth, and make the enemies less moronic. Ground combat feels like it was rushed in testing. With some further tuning, it could have been something really special. Still, many of the details have that certain Bethesda Je ne sais quoi. A zealot's jetpack pops a nozzle from a well-placed bullet, sending him rocketing into the ceiling. A spacer floats upwards in slow motion after he catches a laser blast to the teeth. Mercs ragdoll into the air after a grenade blast hits them head on. And when the smoke clears after a bloody struggle, there's the cathartic satisfaction of digging through the mess to see what useful trinkets your opponents left behind. This all plays into the Bethesda power fantasy that fans have come to know so well, even if those ragdolls get stuck in a railing from time to time. When you're not flattening the surfaces of exciting new planets with your stompy space boots, you're traveling through the void at insane speeds with your very own spacecraft. Well, sort of insane speeds. Space combat's actually really well done. There's intuitive controls and generous auto-aiming that makes blasting away at pirates into mindless fun. It's also possible to cut power to your systems and attempt to go dark to evade enemy sensors, or disable enemy engines for boarding maneuvers, but there's just not much of a point in doing this. Starfield takes a lot of cues from the arcade-style model of No Man's Sky or Star Wars Squadrons here, adding just enough complexity with its systems management angle to feel a little more involved. But with only a handful of weapon types to play around with and enemies to engage, this entire aspect of Starfield is disappointingly shallow. The biggest problem with spaceflight is, well, there's not a whole lot to do out in the big black void. The occasional asteroid field or derelict ship might pop up on your scopes, but it's called called space for a reason. Ain't much out there. Not to say there aren't high points. For example, one of my favorite encounters took place on a zero-g leisure station shortly after a heist attempt went horribly wrong. The occasional distress calls or silly interactions call out through the big empty. I have a really important question for you. Do you know the way to Uranus? I sure hope so. It's right behind you. But most of the time, trekking through the stars feels lacking. The promise of exploring the galaxy brings to mind wild images of blasting off from a space station, passing through the rings of Saturn, looping back to burn through the atmosphere of Neptune at ludicrous speeds. What we ended up with is more of a fast travel system with extra steps. With the exception of one blockade section, there's no real reason to upgrade or replace the basic ship Barrett tosses you at the beginning of the game, because you'll barely be seeing the cockpit unless you go out of your way to do so. And that's really a shame. I wanted to like this more, and with some added depth, planet hopping in Starfield could have been just as fun as other popular spaceflight games like No Man's Sky or Elite Dangerous. Games like those make traveling within a star system interesting by having three speeds, a slow speed to travel locally, a mid speed to cruise between planets or inside upper atmospheres, and a warp speed for heading to a new system. Starfield only has two speeds, slow and menu. Want to take off? That's a menu. Want to land? That's a menu. Want to travel to another star system? That's a menu. This game loves a menu. It's too bad that so many are terribly designed, but we'll come back to that. Galaxy exploration gets a real Mass Effect vibe with this many menus. When placed side by side, it's uncannily similar. This doesn't seem like the best direction for an immersive experience. But on the plus side, you can scan planets and moons from orbit and plop your little ship down next to whatever vital landmarks you find. Whether there's anything worth checking out is another story entirely. 
Planetary exploration at least offers some variety with different biomes. Some of the boreal forests and swampy jungles actually look pretty cool, and many contain a few plants and animals. Starfield actually pulls way, way back to Bethesda's ancient RPGs, Arena and Daggerfall, for this aspect of the game. Points of interest are procedurally generated, like in those two games, but according to interviews with the developers, this actually happens dynamically as you explore. It can feel a little disconcerting when they pop in out of nowhere after walking a few hundred meters, but helps perpetuate the illusion of vast worlds full of forgotten outposts and caves. Even so, after you've seen the third or fourth base with the exact same layout, same loot crates, same enemy placements, and the same goddamn Dickens novels on the shelves, the illusion starts to break down a little. What is it with all the Dickens novels in Starfield? Is it a clumsy attempt to allude to the evils of capitalism? Seems a little ironic coming from the source. Or maybe this is a hidden cry for help from the Bethesda writers. Maybe they're in there, in the Bethesda mines, in a little Bethesda cube. And they're like, please, sir, can I have some more? Some more. Some more um, health insurance and other things and less crunch time, please. Procedural generation is both a solution and a problem here, and Starfield might be the most representative example of the Bethesda recipe. Its randomized locations are short, 10 to 20 minute bites that give the player a mild challenge to punch through and some Skinner boxes to loot. Don't get me wrong, it scratches an itch if all you want to do is hop around a planet and loot stuff, but discovery isn't meaningful if you're discovering the same things over and over again. So if you want to really unearth the best Starfield has to offer, Sticking to the bigger side quests and planetary landmarks is much more satisfying. Hooey! That was quite the journey. I think we need a little break from moving on. Maybe uh, go outside and touch some cats. I got just the thing for you. It's time for Starfield or Garfield. Are you ready to play round two? I've been doing all of my research. All right, well, let's get going here. Round two. Which one features a character trapped on Earth's moon? Starfield or Garfield? You have 10 seconds, go. I only get 10 seconds? I mean, the obvious choice would be Starfield, but I don't even know, no, it's Garfield. It's gotta be Garfield, it's gotta be Garfield. That's time, okay. So Garfield, is that your final selection? Yeah. You are correct. The answer is Garfield. The 1990 episode, Astro Cat, tells the story of Garfield's great uncle Buchanan, the first cat in space who traveled to the moon in 1958. The episode ends with Buchanan being trapped on the moon for decades, awaiting his pizza delivery until astronauts from a much later moon mission stumble across him. And while you can still find pirates or spacers in the procedurally generated locations on Luna, they are free to leave. Allegedly. How does the cat live for decades? Oh, that's a secret only known to Garfield. <laughs> so Garfield's like a mystery wizard now too? Since when has Garfield not been a mystery wizard? He's a cat that eats lasagna. I guess somewhere in the vast archives, Garfield was probably a wizard. I mean, you realize that this cat has been alive for like 40 years. Obviously he's a wizard. Or, I mean, he could be a vampire, he could be a robot, he could have struck a deal with a genie or something. There's a lot of options. I think somewhere in John's house, there's a portrait of Garfield that's like an image of a thousand year old cat fully decomposing like an ancient lich cat. Portrait of Dorian Garfield. So what else is there to do in Starfield? Well, you can research and craft stuff, you can pimp your space ride, and you can build your own little outposts. I guess these fall under the more cozy side of the experience, but all three are held back by poor interfaces and high crafting material requirements. Research is done by cramming various mineral and plant components into a terminal to unlock new crafting recipes, like a reverse vending machine that you fill with seaweed. Simple enough. Crafting the weapon tuning is handled much the same way, with new tiers being gated behind specific perks. That's fine. The biggest problem here is the absolutely stupid amount of inventory management required to hit these material requirements. Requirements. I get that Starfield is going for a little bit more of a hard sci-fi vibe. Item weights are pretty hefty, and I think the idea is to convey how costly and difficult it is to even send one kilo of mass into orbit. The low mass limits in the character and ship inventory are probably meant to lean into this, but playing inventory manager in Starfield's clunky menu is an annoyance. RPGs with bad inventory management are nothing new. Even the fantastic Baldur's Gate 3 has issues with this, but 
Unlike Starfield, you could choose to send loot straight from your stash to anywhere in that game. It would be really nice to see a similar system here. This isn't the first Bethesda game with bad UI choices. In fact, some of the most popular mods for Skyrim and Fallout 4 are interface overhauls. So I guess more than ever, this is part of the Bethesda recipe. The problems with inventory management compound even further when trying to build an outpost. You can slap one of these down nearly anywhere on the surface of a planet, and this works in a similar fashion to build systems in Fallout 4 and Fallout 76, except somehow worse. The control scheme's really unintuitive, and I found myself spending more time fighting the controls than making a cool base. There's also all these weird arbitrary limits. The number of outposts you can have at any one time is limited to eight. Why? This is a single player game. No Man's Sky lets you have 400 bases in a save file. Arbitrary limits don't stop here. Outpost modules are gated behind level progression, so you can't build a lot of the cool stuff until you grind out a decent amount of perk points. And the container limits make no sense. A giant storage crate holds 75 mass, while a tiny little weapon box can store 150. Some elements never worked right for me either, like this giant landing pad that I couldn't put my ship on. Now we're getting into ships. And man, I loves me a game where you can customize a spaceship. Hell yeah. But I sure hate one where the ship building interface is clunky, confusing, and unresponsive. Sure, it's possible to do a lot with what's here, and some impressive builds have already been floating around on the old internet. A ton of parts are on offer to build your own craft from scratch or overhaul your starter space junker. It's just too bad that the interface constantly gets in the way and fights you. The flight check is maddening, not providing any sort of clues as to where your build went wrong. Can't we at least get an arrow or highlight to indicate where the problem is? Just like outpost building, this aspect of the game is also gated behind progression and filled with arbitrary restrictions. You can only keep four ships at a time. Maybe take the Mech Warrior 5 approach, charge a monthly maintenance fee for upkeep, but hang her as many as you want? Ultimately, the crafting, shipbuilding, and outpost elements feel cumbersome and disconnected from the rest of Starfield. It's even more puzzling that so much of this is gated behind arbitrary limits and level progression rather than resources or credits, especially since there's really not much to spend credits on by the end of the game. These are awesome ideas, but super half-baked. Not a single mainline quest even requires you to interact with these systems at all. Starfield really went all in on the Radiant Quest systems. Yeah, it's easy to make Preston Garvey parallels here, but let's not forget that this is a pillar of Bethesda game design that reaches all the way back to the first Elder Scrolls games. Back in the days of Arena and Daggerfall, you could pick up a random quest from pretty much any tavern or guild. This time, the Radiant Quest system takes shape mainly in the form of quest kiosks or outpost supervisors, where you can pick up quick randomly generated jobs for a few space creds. Radiant quests are never more complex than treasure hunts, simple deliveries, or assassinations, but on the plus side, it's possible to just live out your life as a space trucker or bounty hunter and ignore the rest of the game completely. And that's probably the closest that it comes to actual role-playing, even though it has a whole main quest line. Anyway, there's a number of small side quest chains sprinkled throughout the systems, and these are just about as dull as Radiant Quests, often amounting to simple fetch quests with slightly more voice acting and better rewards. The larger side quests offer more compelling content with a couple factions to pursue. There's also some really cute diversions related to your character background choices. For example, the Kid Stuff perk has a side quest chain where you have to visit your parents, which is adorable and has a pretty decent payoff at the end. Companion quests fare slightly better than average, but their pacing is slowly parceled out over time, so it's pretty easy to lose the storytelling threads. Overall, the writing is weak. Don't expect much in the way of narrative choice or divergent paths here. Even the quest chain to join the pirate fleet, which was a favorite, railroads the player into becoming an undercover agent for the UC. So I've got to ask, where are the role-playing possibilities within the story? Calling Starfield an RPG feels generous, and the number of narrative choices you get to make are pretty slim, with most being railroaded away. The biggest offender has to be the main quest line, which is loaded with a number of boring fetch tasks. Longtime Bethesda stands might back this up with a flimsy premise. No one plays the main quest anyway. Well, guess what? I do. I've played them all, and I'm not the only one. Bethesda took this sentiment to heart, however, and it really doesn't feel like the main quest gives anywhere near the amount of agency that players had in Fallout 3, or 4, or even <laughs> Fallout 76. 
There's only a few inconsequential branches over the entire experience, and as a fan of narrative-driven experiences, I find this lack of focus on the main quest and the poorly paced storytelling to be pretty disappointing. A budget-busting company as big as Bethesda should really be able to make some literary gems here, right? But on the other hand, badly toiled storylines are definitely part of the Bethesda recipe, regardless of the quality the tales they weave. Over-reliance on exposition dumps and text logs is something they've been guilty of since Arena, and unfortunately Unfortunately, Starfield is the latest defender. For example, the incredibly complex and awesome story of Daggerfall, likely the best one in the entire Bethesda repertoire, is too convoluted for even most diehards to parse. Jular has an in-depth lore video on the subject if you care to check it out. So if you were about to guess that this is spoiler territory, you'd be right. Major main quest spoilers lie ahead, so if you want to avoid the spoiler skeleton, head to the next chapter. Spoiler skeleton! Let's review real quick. Space mining, big blue alien toenail clipping, life-changing aneurysm, some jackass gives you the keys to his spaceship and robot, space pirates, constellation, massive cosmic mystery. Good. All caught up. From here, the storyline becomes all about those artifacts, and the first couple legs of your journey will take you along to some of the more interesting points in the galaxy while some of your constellation buddies tag alongside you. There's at least the attempt at some fun moments here during your search for the artifacts a rescue mission, a bank robbery gone wrong, some shady corporate dealings, even a mission aboard a vast pirate freighter that borderlines on some immersive sim elements. But the role-playing depth on display is barely surface level. Once you add enough big blue alien toenail clippings to the magic floating hula hoop, this Russian stereotype clues you in on the location of a hidden temple. Stepping through the doors of this temple, you'll notice three things. Gravity gives up on you, the magic rings in the middle of the room start floating around, and little lights appear in midair. Bonking your head on enough of these lights gives you a bigger, better aneurysm. Suddenly, your intrepid space clown gains the ability to make people and small objects float around you. Ooh, so amazing. Not long after you start visiting these temples, fate comes a knocking, and that knock is answered by the Starborn. Some mysterious, technologically advanced beings from an unknown corner of the galaxy. These guys are powerful. In fact, they seem to have a lot of the same powers that you've been collecting. And they want what you got. The big floating pile of Destiny 2 leftovers you've been keeping in the Constellation Lodge. The Starborn decide enough is enough and they hit you at home, resulting in a chase sequence where you have to run through the city of New Atlantis and escape to your ship. I actually thought this was kind of cool at first until I realized there was no way to penetrate the Hunter's plot armor. This is the first breakpoint in the plot where you'll basically be forced to choose which of your companions to save. I decided I could live without fake Lando. This of course leads to a really flat funeral scene a few in-game days later. Since Starfield Field is so bad at establishing its characters and making you give one iota of a shit about them, it was pretty hard to feel any of the desired emotional impact in these so-called heavy moments. A short time later, the Starborn call you out claiming they want a truce and offering to shed some light on the mystery surrounding the artifacts, the temples, and your mysterious newfound powers. Now, I didn't really catch this at first due to the similarities of all the costumes and voices that the Starborn have, but apparently there's two special Starborn that have been chasing you down this entire time. One is named the Hunter, who believes that the most powerful person should have a right to all the artifacts. Another is named the Emissary, who claims the artifacts should be put into his care for safekeeping. And hey, hey, it's time for a big reveal. The Emissary is fake Lando, but from another universe. And the hunter is the head of the kooky space church, but from another universe. Ooh. The Starborn reveal that the artifacts can be put together to form one big artifact called the Armillary. When fully assembled, it allows any grav drive to jump to a nexus between universes, known as the Unity. The pilot can then choose to go through this gate, experience a physical and spiritual rebirth in another universe, and still obtain their past experiences, becoming one of the Starborn themselves. This multiverse stuff so hot right now. Anyway, the Hunter and the Emissary both put their differences aside long enough to agree that you should go check out the ruins of NASA down on the dusty husk of Earth before you decide which of these two jokers is correct. Now, you probably noticed this already, but there's a big common theme that runs through the entire plot. Earth is abandoned due to a gravity apocalypse that shook off all its atmosphere. The crusty blue space cheese you've been pocketing this entire time is often found surrounded by some floating rocks. Hmm. The first power you liberate from an ancient temple lets you alter gravity. The ships all have long-range engines called grav drives. 
you can see where I'm going with this. It comes as no real big surprise that a secret NASA experiment involving one of these very artifacts was the real reason that Earth's atmosphere spun off into the cosmos in the year 2050. The abandoned NASA section is actually one of the best parts of the main quest, and it only made me wish there was more content out there like it. There's a slow build with some well-placed audio logs that breadcrumb the storyline. Yeah, I know audio log storytelling sucks, but here it actually worked pretty well. And there's almost zero combat until you finally uncover the original source of all Earth's troubles. At this point, a big pile of starborn warp in out of nowhere to make your escape complicated. So back to the surface you go, guns a blazing. Once you claw your way back outside, the two jokers you spoke with earlier will be ready and waiting. They force on you the second of the game's breakpoints. Side with the emissary and protect the artifact, or side with the hunter and attempt to take them all for yourself. I chose the not-so-secret third way. Fuck these guys, I'll figure it out when I get there. This made enemies of them both. Now that the artifact hunt has come to an end, it ushers in a lengthy showdown section that overstays its welcome. But after dispatching these two losers, you can fire up the armillary for yourself and take a little peek into the Spider-Verse, where you're going to see how the major decisions you've made in this universe pan out. Now it's time to make the game's final choice. Turn back from the Unity and live your life out in this universe, or step through the portal and become a Starborn with a badass spaceship and a cool new outfit. So yeah, I had some problems with the main plot, even though I felt like its final hours did redeem it a little bit. The pacing is awful, and the premise is completely unoriginal. Tell me if this sounds familiar to you at all. A random ordinary grunt touches an alien artifact, has a strange ominous vision, and gets swept up in a struggle against vastly superior beings. I guess if you're gonna rip off a sci-fi storyline, it might as well be one of the best. Many of the plot beats are just laughably stupid. Barrett tosses you the keys to his ride after meeting you for all of 10 seconds. This entire secret society of explorers deems you worthy of membership simply because you played Delivery Boy. The chief of the Freestar Rangers pulls you off the street to defuse a hostage situation without knowing a single thing about you or your qualifications. These plot holes are black holes, sucking in the rest of Starfield's believability at every turn. The best RPGs excel at creating a world that feels lived in, one where it feels like the wheels of day-to-day -day life will continue to turn whether the player interferes or not. Starfield continually breaks immersion time and time again by creating a universe that seems to exist only for the player. When you take a rest, you'll find them standing in the exact same place hours later as though they were watching you sleep, watching over you like a guardian angel. When the entire world feels like a stage set propped up for only the player's benefit, it's harder to keep the suspension of disbelief intact. That's not saying that the game's presentation is without merit. There's at least some effort to marry the gameplay mechanics with the lore. The enhanced shops provide in-game reasoning to change your character's appearance. Kiosks pass out jobs on a first-come, first-served basis, playing into the whole gig economy vibe of Starfield's galaxy. And the shady trade authority could not care less about the legality of whatever you might be selling. The vision of a post-war future where the stars are dotted with thriving space colonies, filled with bulky space-suited people going about their jobs, and living under the looming threat of dangerous pirates and scavengers is actually a pretty cool. Starfield's visual design pulls a lot of influence from the likes of The Expanse, or Firefly, or Battlestar Galactica. No, not that one. This one. Space looks particularly great. There are massive asteroid fields, debris fields from battles long past, the burning blue of engine exhaust slicing through the void over a backdrop of massive planets and never-ending stars. Planet-side, outdoor environments come across as a bit static and lifeless, experiencing some loss in texture quality, but interiors look crisp and richly detailed. Even though it looks like Bethesda still can't master working mirrors, Creation Engine 2 can be pretty gorgeous at times. I could stroll through wrecked space stations, undercity dungeons, and scummy commercial districts all day long and not get sick of it. The most glaring issue is with the character models, which look somewhat dated and out of place. Conversations all suffer from Oblivion Syndrome, which feels incredibly stiff, especially after playing through the beautifully motion-captured encounters of Baldur's Gate 3. Some of these little talks feel like the stuff of nightmares. Characters have some dead-eyed puppet stares and gaping black maws that open and flap around when they talk. Okay, then. 
Ugh. So there's this one NPC face that keeps following me through the colonies. I see them on like every populated planet. Its eyes piercing into the depths of my being with a soulless, hungry gaze. The hair, the clothes, the body might change, but that face will be burned into my dreams forever. A lot of the randomly generated NPCs tend to stare, burning holes in you with their unblinking eyeballs. The effect is unnerving, and there's already a mod for that. It's no wonder some players have jokingly referred to the game as Stare Field. But more than that, NPCs don't even bother to react when you wave a gun at them or jump on their heads. Nothing short of a direct physical confrontation will cause any sort of response. This just reinforces the soulless feeling that all the major colonies have. On the audio side, it's a little underwhelming. Nothing in this game's OST really stands out as anything more than background padding, and not a single track is memorable. The sound design might be competent, but the popcorn noises that pass for gunfire only make the enemy sponginess more noticeable. Voice acting is competent, but there's a noticeable lack of urgency in the delivery. You've got great talent on display here. Elias Tufexis brings his unmistakable voice to Sam Cole. I am not a scientist, not in the least. Armin Shimmerman takes on the role of space tycoon Walter Stroud. I'm very interested in what Noel can learn from the scans. Sissy Jones plays multiple roles, including the conflicted cultist spy Andrea. Small, reckless, interesting. This flat delivery across nearly all the performances points to an issue with the direction, or more likely, the script. It's not a great sign when the robot companion is the most believable and likable one out of the whole group. This is a difficult question to parse. I do not experience enjoyment. Overall, Starfield's presentation feels uneven. Between the disparate interiors and exteriors, the outdated looking character models, the lackluster sound effects, and the puzzlingly anemic voice acting direction, the entire package is a little underwhelming. So, it's about that time, isn't it? I smell a cat coming on. Gross. I hope you wash your hands. Oh, that time. Oh, yeah, that time. That time. It's time for the final round of Starfield or Garfield. Here's what's riding on this final question. Let's take a look at these prizes. And you, yes you dear viewers, can get in on these fabulous prizes at home. You could win a subscription to our fabulous YouTube channel. Imagine piping hot videos sent directly into your feed whenever you open the phone app or desktop site. Or you could become one of our fine supporters. Help us pay for our two-headed specialty diet of lasagna by dropping a couple dollars on our Patreon, becoming a channel member, or tipping us on Ko-Fi. Final round. Are you ready? Here's the question. You have 10 seconds to respond. Which one prominently features the use of preferred pronouns? Starfield or Garfield? Uh, I, I get, I, Starfield, right? Ooh, I'm sorry. The answer is actually Garfield. Okay, tell me why. <laughs> In a 2014 interview with Mental Floss, Garfield creator Jim Davis stated the following. Garfield is very universal. By virtue of being a cat, really, he's not really male or female or any particular race or nationality, young or old. It gives me a lot more latitude for the humor for the situations. Davis explained that although Garfield is neither male nor female, he does use male pronouns. So collectively, we've been using Garfield's pronouns for literal decades. Love that thing. Yeah. You can choose your pronouns at character creation in Starfield to the ire of screaming baby men everywhere. However, this appears to be the only time in the game where the use of pronouns is even mentioned at all. I'm sorry you didn't get the main prize, but we'll still give you the consolation prize. Feast your eyes on this, a delightful Fallout character themed NFT. It will surely never depreciate in value. Thanks for playing and we'll see you next time on Starfield or Garfield. There's a next time? Over the course of this video, we've explored all the components that make up the Bethesda recipe. These games all feature the seasoned combination of a first-person perspective, a huge scope, procedural elements, a living day-night cycle, crafting systems, mountains of Skinnerbox-style loot, and a vast setting to get lost in. 
They also feature a long tradition of spectacular bugs and technical issues, which goes hand in hand with a history of mod friendliness to band-aid these problems. These elements might not always work together perfectly, but they make up a formula that many have enjoyed and few have replicated. Starfield's marketing showed off a lot of spaceship flying and material mining in an effort to place it as a competitor to space exploration games like Elite Dangerous or No Man's Sky. But instead what we get is a Bethesda game in space. This wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing if the game had the cohesion to pull this off. Sid Meier once said, It's better to make one good game than two great games. During the entire time I spent with Starfield, I kept thinking about this quote. This game feels like two or three decent games sort of cobbled together and none of its systems fully work with each other. It's borderline a marriage but it still contains enough of that ancient Bethesda recipe to keep fans occupied for a long time. Players keep forgiving Bethesda, despite their abysmal business practices, their horribleness towards employees, their non-stop lies from the impish little face of Todd Howard, their questionable disparities in review scores, and their failure to do anything but iterate on the past. Fans are willing to look past all this because Bethesda makes one very specific thing, the comfort food of gaming. They sell it in bulk in a big, flimsy Fallout 76 bag that might pop a seam at any moment. And even though Bethesda's more modern entries only have the substance and nutrition of a big old bag of Cheetos, sometimes all you crave is a comforting snack, a welcoming friend that you can plop down on the couch next to, alongside your three-foot bong, and just veg. Yeah, it's a cozy one. Starfield feels a little sleepy, a little dated and behind the curve, and you know what? That can be okay. Cozy games definitely have a big place in our world. But at this point, you can almost feel the developer fatigue behind its droopy little eyes, even down to the misphrased memes and half-hearted attempts at humor. It seems like the secret sauce is getting spread a little thin these days. Bethesda is going to have to do something more to jazz up their future releases if they want to continue satisfying the cravings that only a Bethesda game can fill. Otherwise, fans will eventually flock back to their old familiar playgrounds. With Starfield, as with all big Bethesda games, what you get out of it is often proportional to what you put into it. This goes double for all those mad modder fans out there that are willing to change and improve the experience for others. Is it groundbreaking? No. Is it the best effort from Bethesda so far? Far from it. But is it a decent entry point into that niche brand of open world games that only Bethesda makes? Sure. Thanks for walking this journey with us. And if you've thought of something we might have overlooked about the Bethesda recipe, let us know down in the comments or on social media. Hey, while we were in the process of making this video, it looks like our channel hit 2,000 subs. So we want to say thank you for all the time you spent with Two-Headed Hero. We hope you stick around because we have a lot more ideas to cover. Thanks again for being part of our little journey. We'll see you on the next Two-Headed Hero. Bring lots of spaghetti. I'm spaghetti.